six Nice Christmas? Yeah. Santa Claus treats you well? Quite a few goodies that were sent our way, but unfortunately she's diabetic, so I have to eat them all. I'll take care of them. Yeah, I'll do that. I found all the clothes already. Anyway, thank you for being. Let me give you some results. Uh, Christmas Eve, five nights ago, that's right now, six nights ago. 380. Total between the two services, we had seven, almost 80 at the 430, and then uh, almost 300. So thank you. All of you were there. Made that possible. We appreciate you supporting us that way. Uh, we have a very generous offering of over twenty-two hundred dollars that will be shared between uh, the mission group and uh, social concerns. I believe was the other one. I guess today ordered this spend. So congratulations and thank you for being a part. Here we and here we are. Uh, we, we made it through December twenty-first was the Mayan calendar said we were all going somewhere. And evidently they're wrong, that's why they don't exist anymore. <laughs> I Ching was the other one that said the prophecy was about the same time because he was 500 years before the Mayan calendar and he's gone too, so we're in pretty good shape. Thank you for not getting overly concerned or worried about those prophecies. Uh, there have been prophecy of doom since day one and none of them have come true. So. Don't get too excited about it. Um, other words of wisdom you want to share with us this morning? We're, we're just going to roll right on through today. Other words of wisdom to share with us? You good? You ready to worship? Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs>
will sing of God's steadfast love, we will proclaim God's faithfulness to all generations. For the Lord's steadfast love has been established forever, and God's faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Our first hymn is number 235, Rockabye, My Dear Little Boy. We will sing the only two verses that are in the hymn, verses 1 and 2.
in those valleys from time to time, and that's just that's just who we are. We go through that. It's a, it's a cycle of life. And nobody stays on a big high, and nobody stays on a big low. We, we vacillate from place to place. The great thing is, is that God says, hey, I'll be with you in all of your sins, whether we're on the real highs, or whether we find ourselves in the real low. God is there for us all. Would you be kind enough to take the hand of somebody next to you, please, and let's pray for you.
kids I woke up this morning just didn't feel like I was all the way awake. That's why I had a half a cup of coffee. Still didn't feel like I was all the way awake, so I did half my hair, shaved half my face, put on half a tie, drove to work at about half the speed I would normally drive because you know it's icy out there. And I got here and I just still didn't feel like I was all the way here. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that? How do you feel like that right now? Oh, okay. But all of this made me think about a story I read about halfway Herbert. Like my sheep. So let me tell you guys a story about halfway Herbert. Can everybody see me? Okay, this is a story about halfway Herbert. Halfway Herbert. Herbert Hallywag was seven and a half years old, three and a half feet tall, and 55 and a half pounds heavy. He had lots and lots of friends, but none of them called him Herbert. Called him Herbert. Instead, everyone called him halfway. Not because his house was halfway in California. <laughs> and it's not because his dog was, imagine this, not because his dog was half bulldog and half poodle. <laughs> I know you can't see that, but maybe some of you go front. Sadly, it was because Herbert did everything halfway. Halfway Herbert never put his whole heart into anything. He never really tried. Something was missing in Halfway Herbert. When Herbert brushed his teeth, he started at the top, but he was too lazy to finish the bottom. Ooh! He spent a lot of time at the dentist's office. His dad's not the pedal boy. <laughs> at school, Herbert did only half his homework. And he answered only half the questions on his test. Therefore, he only learned half of what he was supposed to learn. Herbert never finished his meals, so he was always hungry halfway between lunch and dinner. Herbert was tired from getting only half the sleep that he needed and half the food that he needed. And when Herbert played soccer, he listened to only half of what his coach told him. He really tried during, well, if you get to only half the game. Herbert would have had more fun if he'd have played with his whole heart. His team would have been a lot happier, too. One day, when Herbert went out to play, he tied the laces on only one shoe. He walked halfway up a big hill, hopped on his bike, and started pedaling as fast as he could. He was going faster and faster and faster, and suddenly his shoelace got caught in the wheel. In the wheel. Herbert crashed straight into his daddy's car. His bike was all bent up, his leg was hurt, and his dad's car had a huge dent in it. Herbert knew he had made a big mistake. When Herbert's dad saw the dent in his car, he asked, Herbert, do you know what happened to my car? Herbert didn't want to lie. But he didn't want to get in trouble either. So do you know what he said? He said, well, I didn't see anyone crash into your car, Daddy. But it was only half the truth. But, but soon the telephone rang. I was just calling to ask if Herbert was all right, said the neighbor. I saw him crash his bike into your car this morning. I thought he might have gotten hurt. Uh oh. <laughs> That's not good. Herbert tried to explain. Well, Dad, I said I didn't see anyone crash into your car, and that's true. I had my eyes closed. <laughs> Herbert said his dad, you tried to trick me. Only telling half the truth is a whole lie. 
And living your life just halfway, well, that is no way either. Jesus doesn't want us to love him halfway. God doesn't want us to live out of just half of our hearts. In fact, he tells us this in the Bible. Jesus told his friends about a man who was planning to build this huge tower. But before he started building, he made sure he had enough money to finish building the whole tower. He made sure the tower was strong and would stand for a long time. He didn't want to be teased for his work. And he wanted others to know that he was a very hard worker. This man did not just try halfway with his tower. And we shouldn't follow Jesus just halfway either. He deserves our whole hearts and our total devotion. But I've never been able to do things all the way, cried Herbert. God knows that none of us can love him all the way by ourselves. So he gave us a friend called the Holy Spirit to help us live out of our whole hearts. Herbert's dad said, when we decide to follow Jesus all the way, God's Spirit fills up our hearts and Jesus helps us to obey God. Herbert said he wanted to pray. He asked his dad, can God's Spirit help me too? Yes, his dad answered. In fact, God loves it when we ask for help. You guys ever asked God for help? So Herbert prayed, Dear Jesus, I am sorry I have not obeyed you. I want to follow you, but I don't want to follow you just halfway. I need your help. Please give me your spirit so I can know how to follow you all the way. And guess what? God answered Herbert's prayer. Now he finishes things. He ties both his shoes, eats all his lunch, and listens to everything his teachers, his parents, and his coaches tell him. He also tries to obey what he reads in the Bible. Now he isn't perfect, but God helps him. Herbert has never been happier, and no one calls him halfway Herbert anymore. The Bible says in Matthew 20 through 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Is that a good story? Do you think I should go home and shave all of my face and all of my hair and put on a whole shirt and shoes that match? <laughs> Kids, I hope you enjoyed that story. Uh, would you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you uh, for each of these amazing kids that are seated here with me today. I ask, Father, that uh, if there's anything at all in your life that they're just doing halfway, I ask that you would um, empower them and help them to do things all the way with their whole heart. And if they feel like they just can't do that, remind them that you promised to be there with them and to help them to make them strong. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Halfway Aaron. <laughs> Let's not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time, if we do not give up. The ushers will now wait upon us.
bring food to a starving world, give answers to a searching mind, bring healing to a diseased body, give direction to a questioning spirit. Please be seated. Jesus 
parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Would you bow your heads and let's prepare our hearts for the receiving of today's message, please. This last Sunday of our calendar year, we come together as family and friend and guests and longtime worshipers, supporters, givers, officers, and good sheep. So we have come to be a part of this ceremony where we say goodbye to 2012. And we begin looking forward. Lord, you know that some of the uh, incidents that place in our church are not always welcomed. And we have some wonderful things that have happened here this year as well. But what we do know is that you are with us in the highs of life and in the lows. And thank you for reminding us that we have been created in your image. And you want us to follow after this example given to us by Jesus Christ. Be with us by the power of your Holy Spirit for this service as we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before we begin, I'm going to ask you a question, but I want no response by a show of hands. You ever lose any of your kids? I should say, did you ever wish you could lose any of your kids? You know, that, that happens from time to time. I don't know whether you, you got so busy or you were worried about your GPS or your schedules or you were reading a map or this doctor's appointments or getting from here to there to take a mom and dad someplace, but you just got so involved that you just didn't notice that one of the kids got left behind. Tyler Payne, age six. His family got out of the, got out of their station wagon somewhere around Memphis, Tennessee. They all needed to go to the bathroom, and Tyler was the last one out. He went to the bathroom and discovered he couldn't get out of the bathroom because the door had become stuck. However, his family, five brothers, one sister, and mom and dad, all piled back into the station wagon and headed west to Texas where they lived. Somewhere around Jackson, Mississippi, at a Wendy's restaurant, one of the brothers said, where's Tyler? And that's when they discovered he was missing. And so they immediately they turned around and went back 
to Tennessee. Now, Tyler was still trapped, and he's screaming his head off, and a cleaning lady hears him, and she's able to give him the door open and allow him out. Now, everybody at the rest stop was just trying to pacify Tyler, uh, but all he wanted to do was scream, I want my mom. <laughs> when the family was reunited, Dad said, you know, normally we have a head count, but for some reason we just neglected to do that, and we lost track of Tyler. This is an embarrassing situation for my family. Mom said, I was sick to my stomach when I found out that Tyler was not in the station wagon. Little Tyler was reunited with his family, and he was clinging tightly to his mother and said, I'll never go to the bathroom again. <laughs>
It was the Sabbath when he did this on And that's important because anybody doing work on the Sabbath, it was condemned by other Jews. There were also many children playing with him at the time. Now there was a certain Jew that saw what Jesus was doing and playing and working on the Sabbath, and he went at once and told the father, Joseph, see, your child is at the brook, and he has taken clay and fashioned twelve birds and has profaned the Sabbath. And when Joseph came to the place and saw it, he cried out to Jesus, saying, Why do you do this on the Sabbath when you ought not be doing it? But Jesus clapped his hands and cried to the sparrows, Off with you! And the sparrows came alive and took flight and went away chirping. The Jews were amazed when they saw this and went away and told their elders what they had seen Jesus do. He was five, according to that one. Here's another one. After some days, Jesus was playing in the upper story of a house, and one of the children who were playing with him fell down from the house and died. And when the other children saw it, they fled, leaving Jesus with the deceased boy alone. And the parents of him that was dead came and accused Jesus of having thrown him down. But Jesus replied, I did not throw him down. But they continued to revile him. Then Jesus leapt down from the roof and stood by the body of the child and cried out with a loud voice, Zenon, that was the name of the boy, arise and tell me, did I throw you down? And at once, Zenon stood up and said, no, Lord, you did not throw me down, but you raised me up. And when they saw that, they were amazed, and the parents of the child glorified God for the miracle that had just happened and worshipped Jesus. His father was a carpenter and at the time made plows and yokes, and he received an order from a rich man to make a bed. But when one beam was found to be shorter than its corresponding one, they did not know what to do. The child Jesus said to his father Joseph, Put the two pieces of wood and make them even from the middle to the end. And Joseph did as the child told him. Jesus stood there on the other end and took hold of the shorter piece of wood and stretching it, made it equal with the other. His father Joseph saw it and was amazed, and he embraced the child and kissed him and said, Happy am I that God has given me you as a child. Now this one you'll recognize. And when he was 12 years old, his parents went according to the custom to Jerusalem to the feast of the Passover with their company. And after the Passover, they returned to their house. But while they were returning, the child Jesus went back to Jerusalem as his parents supposed that he was in their company. And when they had gone about a day's journey, they sought him among their kinfolk, and when they did not find him, they were troubled, and returned to the city, seeking him. After the third day, any of this sound familiar? After the third day, they found him in the temple, sitting with the teachers, listening to the law and asking them questions. And they all paid attention to him and marveled how he, as a child, put to silence the elders and the teachers of the people, expounding the sections of the law and saying of the prophets. And his mother, Mary, came near and said to him, Why have you done this to us, child? Behold, we have sought you in sorrow. And Jesus said to her, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But the scribes and the Pharisees said, Are you the mother of this child? And she said, I am. And they said to her, Blessed are you among women, because the Lord has blessed the fruit of your womb. For such glory and such excellence and wisdom we have never seen nor heard. And Jesus arose and followed his mother and was subject to his parents. But his mother kept all these things in her heart that had taken place. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and grace. To him be the glory forever and ever. Some great stories about Jesus, and they're all called legends because they're only found maybe in one place. Did he do all of these things? Probably so. Would you make a case that he didn't do all of these things? Probably so. Those are legends. Jesus is 12 years old, and his parents take him on this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And as they are returning home, they discover Jesus is not among the family and friends. Now, there is a significance why Luke tells us 
specifically that Jesus is 12 years of age. To be 12 years of age, living in his time and in his culture, means you were on the verge of manhood. In that time, in that culture, a 12-year-old boy was expected to begin to shoulder responsibilities, more so than we would expect of a 12-year-old boy in today's culture. If Jesus were a girl, he would be betrothed by now. The senseless crimes we are witnessing involving the capture and murder and kidnapping of children was not such a stain on the society of the first century as it is today. Parents just simply did not need to worry so much about their children. Her child could go out and play and walk in the city and not be threatened. Since 1970, that was the first year that children's pictures began appearing on milk cartons saying this child is missing, can you help us? Parents have become much more careful and much more watchful of their children. Times change and worries change. Still, it seems a little unusual to me that it took them an entire day before they missed where Jesus was. It was a difficult trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They had to, they probably traveled through the country of Samaria, and that was not a that was a hostile place for Jews at that time. There were road bandits, there were pirates, there was severe weather, and there were Roman soldiers who absolutely despised Jews. This is why Mary and Joseph journeyed from Nazareth to Jerusalem with friends to and from the city of Jerusalem. There is still safety. In numbers. In those days, the women and children walked out front, and the men rode up the rear. Thinking Jesus was up front with Mary, and Mary thinking Jesus is back there with Joseph, off they go with this company of pilgrims. They travel a day before they miss him, and when they fight, fail to find him. Evidently, Mary and Joseph got together and said, Have you seen Jesus? The one said no, the other said no, they did not know him. We've left him behind. And so they immediately turn around and go back to the holy city. Scripture says three days later. Three days. Bad enough to miss him for one day. Now it takes them three days to find him. And of all places, where is he? He's not with the kids. He's not in preschool. He's in the temple. Three days, I think that's significant. Bad enough missing a child for a day, but three. And he's sitting among the teachers and he's listening and he's asking these profound questions and he's offering his wisdom to them. And Luke tells us that everyone who heard him was astonished at his understanding and at his answers. And when his parents saw him and where he was, they were astonished, but I can imagine that their astonishment was probably tempered by some exasperation of not being able to find him. And so Mary says, son, why have you treated us like that? Your father and I have been looking everywhere for you anxiously. And here, when Jesus answers, it seemed just a bit insensitive. If you're a parent, why are you looking for me, he said. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house. And then Luke adds these very, when you get back home, read it again. After, after they find Jesus, he gives his response. Luke says these interesting words, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Is there anyone in this room who has not felt that sometime in your life your parents didn't understand you? Of course not. We have all felt that somewhere along our adolescent years that our family and our friends just simply did not understand us. Conflict in the home with misunderstanding is as old as the Garden of Eden. It's not easy being a parent, not easy being a child at any age. A teenager who had just received her learner's permit offered to drive her parents to church. And evidently she was not really good at it, so after this hair-raising trip from the house to the front door of the church, when the mother got out of the car, she said, thank you. And the teenager said, anytime. 
And as the mother walked away up the steps toward the church, she said, I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to God. <laughs> Not easy being a parent. Especially a child around 12 or 13 years of age. One woman said, Doctor, I'd like to have you evaluate my 13-year-old son. And without the next sentence, the doctor says, Okay, he's suffering from transient psychosis with an intermittent rage disorder, function weighted by episodic radical mood changes, but his prognosis is good for full recovery. And the brother said, How can you say that? You've not even met with the child. And the doctor said, Oh, I thought you said he was 13. It's not easy being a parent. It's not easy being a child. And nature has constructed all of us, and I undermine the word all of us. If we go through those radical hormonal changes and physical changes and emotional changes as we enter adolescence, we all have done it. We may not remember it, but we all did it. And it's at that time when the children start distancing themselves. Start looking for their own identity in life. Remember too, please, that even as an adult, Jesus' family did not totally understand him. You may remember a few weeks ago when we were looking at the book of Mark, uh, Jesus' family had came to him and had said, you know, brother, we need to take you home. They thought he had literally gone off the deep end. They wanted him out of the ministry. He was saying things that were totally contradictory to the established religion at the time. They said, come on home, brother. There's something wrong with your head. Anybody in your family ever think you were going a little too far out? If it can happen to Jesus, it can happen to you. And he was perfect. People worry about their children regardless of how old we become. As time passes, hopefully the children begin worrying about the adult particularly aging parents. And isn't that a part of what we do as a Christian family? We worry about the older ones, we concern ourselves with the younger ones. Jesus' family did not always understand him, but I do know this, they were committed to him. And he knew it. He knew it in his heart of ours. I think that's an important aspect of all of our families that we are represented here this morning. Parents and children need one another. Young people and old people need to know that our parents and our children are committed to them and nothing will break that commitment. Nothing will break that commitment. The tired mom opened the front door of her home to find the young minister from the neighborhood church sitting in her front room talking to the kids. The pastor turned to her as she walked in and he said, I'm collecting donations for the new children's orphanage that we're building, and I hope you can give what you, what you can. The mom said, sure thing, I can give you two boys or two girls or one of each, whatever it takes. <laughs> Some of you know exactly how that mother felt, and you also know she was kidding. There was nothing she would exchange for her babies. Jesus' family was bound together by mutual love and respect. I, I, I know that that's how this story ends. Because of what Luke tells us in the last couple of verses. Why are you searching for me? Jesus said, don't you know that I am required to be in my father's house? And Luke records the following statement right after that. He went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. He went home with his mom and dad to Nazareth and he was obedient to them. And he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now... That's a great statement. Honor your father. Honor your mother. Jesus knew that at home, he, that Mary and Joseph, his mother and father, were committed to him. Brother Teresa once said that only when love abides at home can we share it with our neighbors. Does that make sense? Only when love abides at home we shared across the fence. I think that's the way it's supposed to be in the Christian family, in the Christian church. Material blessings are nice, and some of us have it, and some of us don't, and, but that's not the only thing that matters in the home. <laughs> the children need to know that we love them. 
The parents need to know that the children will come. There will be misunderstandings. There will be conflicts. There will be words that you say you wish you could pluck out of the air and put back in your mouth. But there should also be respect, commitment, and acceptance, and forgiveness. So much so that there is a bond between the parents and the child or children that nothing, nothing can break. The strength of love as Jesus offers it to us. As he loves us, we're to love each other. Not just in words, but in action and in deeds. Mary and Joseph turned around in 180 and went back to Jerusalem when they were searching for Jesus. And they found him. He became an integral part of their home, an integral part of their family. I hope you are still searching. And I hope that you are finding this gift that God has given to us. Let's bow our heads for a moment, please.
they wanted to know how we were doing with our, our baptisms of, of infants, or baptisms of people in general. Uh, how will we raise our attendance level? How will we raise the money necessary to provide the programs and the ministries that we have? And it really it falls on us. And what we did in 2012 is that we said we would try to reach a goal of attendance of 212. And we have surpassed that. Thank you for being a part of that over, over the uh, course of a year. We take all the attendance we divide by 52, and it gives us just about what we are. Uh, this year, or next year, for 2013, we have raised that to 220. We have raised that to 220. Now, does that sound like an impossible figure? No, not really, because if you just think back of last Sunday, the Sunday before, and the Sunday before that, we were, we were averaging almost 350 just in Sunday morning worship services. You, you did great on Christmas Eve. Uh, you, you went far beyond my greatest expectation. Thank you for doing this. But through the week, we have the capabilities of uh, inviting and welcoming new people to our church. So I want you to put that on one of your, your resolutions for 2013, that you begin inviting and welcoming you're a great group. We have a great choir. We have a great youth program here. I think we can just expand on it and continue to work. Thank you for hearing my unwanted editorial advice. Gracious Lord, we thank you for being with us this morning. We appreciate your time with us. You've been with us all year. We know that you will be with us in years and decades to come. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. And we thank you for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Be with us as we leave this place. And all these people said, Amen. God is good. Amen.